And let us remember um, that the same power and spirit that rose Christ from the dead has gathered us here together this morning. So let us think about that as we listen. Happy Easter, everyone. Please join me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let us worship the living and resurrected Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy One, you come to us with power beyond all knowing. You lift all things out of the dust. You breathe love into every one of us. You call us into communion with you. You claim victory over death. Open our eyes, soften our hearts by the work of your Holy Spirit that in, your, in the hearing of your word, we may receive new life. Amen. Please rise as we sing our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, as printed in your bulletin.
Jesus rising from the dead assures us that we too have been given new life. Let us repent of our sin before God and one another, confident of God's victory over sin, death, and evil. Please join us in our call to confession as printed in your bulletin. All-knowing, all-powerful God, we confess that even on this most holy day, we are unable to comprehend the victory over death shown to us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess our utter dependence on you, not only for life, but also for faith, hope, and love. Without your astonishing appearance and your stunning presence throughout the ages, we would be lost. Forgive us and transform us that in every way our work and prayer will make whole what is broken and give peace on earth. Amen. By the grace of God, the good news of Jesus' resurrection has become our rock and our salvation. Hear the good news. I declare you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Today's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 1 through 
18. Hear now the word of the Lord. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have yet to ascend to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had all these things that he had said to her. The word of the Lord. We have and we continue to go through a great deal during this pandemic. It has truly been a time of testing. And during times of testing, things get revealed. Things get exposed, don't they? Well, here's what I've noticed has been revealed or exposed. Freedom and responsibility. There's a lot of talk in this past year about freedom and our freedoms. Maybe not so much about responsibility. Let's talk about freedom first. Freedom is what this country was founded upon. As a colony, we sought to break off against the British so that we can be free. The Declaration of Independence talks specifically about three unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. The Bill of Rights then gets created so that our personal and collective freedoms would be protected. We enjoy so many freedoms in this great nation. Now, some groups more than others, no doubt, and we have learned over this past year that we cannot or should not take these freedoms for granted, that we have to continue to work and stand up for them and fight for them. And so there's freedom, but there's also responsibility. Maybe others might prefer the term obligation. Now the best description that I have ever found for what I'm referring to in terms of responsibility and obligation was written by Dr. King. Here's the anniversary today of his assassination. These words come from his letter from the Birmingham jail. In a real sense, all of life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. 
Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be who I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. And you can never be who you ought to be until I am who I ought, who I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Dr. King is saying we all have a responsibility or an obligation to look after the well-being of one another. We all have a responsibility to do what is necessary to keep one another safe and healthy. We have a responsibility to serve the common good, to be a positive contributing member of our society to make this world a better place to live. Being in a pandemic, drastic, unfamiliar behaviors, wearing a mask, practicing social distancing and staying away from large crowds, now getting vaccinated, it has tested this balance between freedom and the responsibility that we have to keep one another safe and doing our part to bring this pandemic to an end. Now, this struggle has been more intense in some states than others, in some congregations more than others. What in the world does this all have to do with Easter? Well, I've been thinking about Jesus' last week, this Passion Week, and I've noticed Jesus constantly wrestling with freedom and responsibility. On that Palm Sunday, when all these throngs of people gathered, they wanted Jesus to be their military leader, their earthly king. He had a freedom, he had choice, he could have gone along with it, yet he refused to do so. Two days later, he's in the temple. He sees all these merchants making tons of money on these weary travelers that have traveled from all over Palestine. He could have said, hey, how can I get in on this racket? How can I get a little? And yet instead, he overturns their tables. Get to the Last Supper. We've heard these words the last couple weeks. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But then he responds, no. For this is the exact reason that I came. A couple hours pass by, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if this is your will, take this cup from me. Then he follows up with these words, but not my will, but yours be done. Soldiers come, Peter's there. He still has freedom and choice to protect and preserve his life. And yet he says to Peter, put your sword away. For this is the reason that I have come. Goes before Pontius Pilate. Still, Pontius Pilate asks him, are you a king? Could have said, no, you are. Please let me go. And he says, it is as you say. Now he's on the cross. One of the criminals that says, you've saved others. Save yourself. One more chance. He refuses and ultimately breathes his last breath. Jesus had the freedom, he had the ability to avoid pain and suffering and crucifixion. He openly expressed his desire to live multiple times. And yet his response was founded upon the responsibility and knowing that if he were to lay his life down, all of creation would be set free and this world would be changed forever. Now, how was this world changed forever? In laying his very life down, he proved there's a different, better way to live. He proved sacrificial love is the most powerful force there is. So as we have heard, the disciples and the women, they come on that early morning. 
come to the tomb looking for a corpse. And they found someone who has been raised from the dead. Resurrected from the dead. Christ is risen. Let's try that again. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Every week that I prepare a sermon and I look at the text, I always find words of comfort and words of challenge. Now, in the weeks where the passage is mostly filled with words of challenge, I don't get a lot of good sleep. I wrestle with how do I preach this text faithfully, this challenging text in a way that you can hear it, in a way you may squirm in your seats, but you won't get up and leave. Now, the other texts that are filled with mostly comfort, I love those texts. I know you do too. I get a lot better sleep that week to be able to come in, to preach the good news of the gospel, to have words that just fill you with hope and joy and peace. After a year of so much death, so much evil that remains in this world, we need those words. We need to hear those words today, and I want you to be uplifted by the joy and the peace in knowing that what Jesus did, God isn't asking us to do. Christ has accomplished it for all time and for all people. That sin has been overcome. That the chains of evil have been broken. That death no longer has its final say. And yet at the same time, I also want you to hear this news. That in this text are words of comfort and of challenge. We heard it when Jesus gives this commandment on the last night. Love one another as I have loved you. The Apostle Paul says a little bit differently in Philippians chapter 2 where he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We have been given a challenge as Christians to live like Christ. This includes the freedoms that we enjoy and the responsibilities that we have towards one another. When we take up the challenge to live like Christ, life doesn't get any easier or smoother, it actually gets harder, it gets more challenging but it also gets better. And here's what I mean. I want you, let's do a thought experiment. I want you to imagine yourself to make your decisions based purely upon what is best for you and you alone. Let's put ourselves in this context of being in the pandemic. Now, when you put on that mask, do you? Or is it just too uncomfortable? Do you practice social distancing? Do you make the choice to get vaccinated? Now, if you are older, if maybe you have pre-existing conditions, maybe you believe our scientists and our experts in terms of self-preservation, you say yes to all three to help you from getting sick. Now put yourself in the shoes of a 20-year-old college student. All his friends are heading down to Florida for spring break. Now that choice gets a little bit tougher, doesn't it? Let's extend this thought experiment out beyond the pandemic. Imagine an entire world, every single person making decisions based only upon what is best for themselves. What kind of world would we live in? I think it'd be another disaster. I think it would be chaos. I think it would be filled with violence and corruption and greed. I think we would see destruction as far as the eye can see. If you think this world is messed up now, imagine that kind of world where everyone only cares about themselves and just does whatever it is that makes them feel good. That is not the kind of world that God had in mind. In fact, that is exactly the world that Christ came here to transform. 
in and through Christ Jesus, we are given a better, different way to live. Because unbridled freedom without responsibility to our neighbor is not freedom at all. C.S. Lewis once wrote, a familiar captivity is frequently more desirable than unfamiliar freedom. Christ is calling us to an unfamiliar freedom today, a different way of living where we change our mindset so that it mirrors Christ's. Now let us hold on to our freedoms while elevating our levels of responsibility towards one another to where rightfully belongs. Now what decisions will you make when you place the well-beings of others before your own? Now what decisions will you make and levels of discomfort and sacrifice will you make in your everyday life? So many different choices. I want to commend both Slackwood and Grace for being examples for over a year now of embracing both our freedoms and our responsibilities. It's been 13 months since we've sing, sang together. We need to continue to be a shining example of lifting up both in the months to come, no matter how tired you are, no matter how exhausted you may be. And let us extend this mindset beyond the pandemic to our family members and our friends and our coworkers. How would your life be different? How would you speak to one another? How would you choose to spend your time? Who'd be the one emptying and loading the dishwasher and taking out the trash? Freedom and responsibility. What would it look like as a member of Slackwood or Grace? As a US citizen or resident? As a global citizen? Can you imagine if everyone had this mindset? If everyone had the mind of Christ? Where we care more about the well-being and welfare of others than we do our own? That's why today is my favorite day of the year. Because Christ's life, death, and resurrection has taught us that there is a better way to live. Imagine driving around and you know that the other drivers have your welfare in front of their own. That's hilarious on the East Coast, imagining that. Imagine what it would be like how we would treat our environment when we thought about future generations and what we're putting into our air and our water and our soil. Imagine how we would respond to people of color who are pleading for us to recognize how they are being mistreated, how they are being killed in a fashion as if their life doesn't matter. Over time, if we listened and if we responded, inequality and injustice would be no more. Wars would cease. Homelessness, poverty, starvation, all these things would be things of the past. Wouldn't that be amazing? Now this isn't some, some made up utopia. This is not just some unrealistic pipe dream. This is what Jesus Christ talked about more than any other subject in his ministry. He called it the kingdom of God. We pray for it to come down every single week. I'm describing the kind of world that Jesus had in mind is exactly what compelled him to lay his very life down so that this might actually become a reality. If each and every one of us strived to have the mind of Christ, utilizing our freedoms and our responsibility to look out for the well-being of one another, what a life we would live, what a world we would live in. On that Easter morning, Christ proved there is a better way to live, a life where freedom and responsibility stand side by side, 
Now we are called to live that out. Amen. Please pray with me. God of the resurrection, God of hope, we praise you and we worship you on this beautiful day. For that empty tomb, thank you. For bringing a better way to live, thank you. For your loving presence, alive, powerful, resurrected, thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us and keep us from you. We lift up all who are grateful for all that you have done in your lives at this time. Through your son, Jesus, help us to grasp resurrection hope, to understand its power in our everyday lives, to recognize its force at work in the world, overturning empires, challenging our selfishness within us, providing healing and justice to those who are oppressed, and bending our lives towards truth and towards love. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors, proclaiming the good news by what we say and by what we do. Good news in our kitchens and our living rooms. Good news in our workplaces and classrooms. Help us to be that good news. Walking softly as stewards of this planet and caring gently for our people. Living hopefully into your kingdom that continues to break into this world. Today, today we think of all who are grieving, who are sick, and who are ill. We lift them up silently to you at this time. We pray that you would comfort and heal as only you can. We pray for the places in this world that are torn by warfare and bloodshed. Lord, in times of turmoil and uncertainty, help us to place our trust in you. May you be the focus and the center of our lives and so much chaos that swirls around us. We pray may, that we may hear your voice and have the courage to follow you where you lead us. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch sight of your kingdom come. In the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to live into being a true reflection of Christ. Amen. With compassion for all of our needs and all that we have been through, the risen and reigning one remains by our side, calling us by name. Let us with the same mercy be able to, at this time to consider the tithes and offerings that relieve the suffering of this world, that proclaim the good news far and wide through the various ministries that we are a part of, both Slackwood and at Grace. There is a offering box that you can use at the end of the service, and there's also, also online giving at either one of our websites. Let us bow our heads and pray. Holy God, you shower us with gifts that are so abundant, we cannot measure them all. You give us life itself and the power to befriend our companions in this world. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need. In the name of the Creator and the Redeemer 
and the sustainer, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise as we sing our communion hymn, which is printed in your bulletin. During this time, our ushers will be going around bringing the elements for communion. Please be seated. Friends, try that again. Friends, <laughs> this is a joyful feast where people come from the north and the south and the east and the west from every direction and gather and sit at table and join God. Jesus is the one who invites us to share in this feast which he has prepared. Lord Jesus, on that night before his crucifixion, he took a piece of bread and after giving thanks for it, he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Every time you do this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen and reigning Lord until he comes again. And so with thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts, let us offer our grateful praise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Good and gracious God, we pray that by these elements, the bread and the juice, that your Holy Spirit would be present, that you would be present, that it would, you would use it to strengthen and to nourish us at this table, knowing that your redemptive love offers us new life in and through your son, Jesus. Help us who recognize our Lord 
in the breaking of the bread, to see and to serve him in all lives who are broken, including our very own. Give us who are fed here the grace to share our bread and our possessions with the hungry and the lonely and the forgotten and the oppressed. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes again in final victory, where we shall see all the saints gathered around and we shall feast in your presence. We pray this in the name of Christ, who taught us the prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everyone is welcome at the Lord's table. I invite you to uh, prepare the bread and then we will partake of it together at one time and then we will do so in the same fashion with the juice. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Let us pray. Loving God, we rejoice that the grave could not hold your son, that he has conquered death, risen to rule over all powers on this earth. We praise you that he called us into a new life to follow him with joy and with gladness by your spirit Lift us from despair and doubt. Set our feet firm on the faith and hope that comes only from you. Their lives may be signs of new life. And all we have may show forth the love that your son demonstrated on that cross and throughout his life. A love that was so powerful that even death could not hold him. So for all praise and glory and thanksgiving to you, our God, now and forevermore, amen. Please rise as we sing our sending hymn as printed in your bulletin.
We have learned, we have been taught from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that when we lift up the life of others around us, we are lifted up. It's amazing. Hear now this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serving God as you look for opportunities to lift one another up. Amen.